Greetings and welcome. We are in AP English, and our agenda today is uh, an introduction to uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, and more specifically, Inferno. Let me begin by, and I'm working off of some lecture notes, so you'll have those in front of you, that page two of the uh, lecture notes, that is to say some of the history here. Let's, uh, let's begin, first of all, by just making some general observations about this text, and uh, then we'll get into it. Let's first of all point out that uh, it was the great poet T.S. Eliot that said you can't really read this poem, it's too complicated. Uh, there's, there's a good argument to be made for that, that, that Dante's Inferno is a text which you know, is very difficult to read. Let's, uh, let's try and make it a little bit more accessible, shall we? First of all, let's point out that when we pick up Dante's Inferno, we are actually picking up a poem that is a subset or a part of a larger poem. That total poem is called <coughs> The Divine Comedy. And that's kind of a strange title for us because we don't think of the word comedy the way Dante thought of the word comedy. That is to say, if you pick up Dante's Inferno and read it, trying to find something comedic, uh, comedy, you're going to be a little bit lost. All right, so what do we mean when we use the word comedy? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a working definition, uh, a word, and that word is drama, the divine drama. Now, I don't mean eighth grade drama, drama, drama here. What I rather mean is an epic story. What we really would call this probably today is the divine epic, okay, an epic poem, if you will. Well, let's, let's go ahead now and remind ourselves that we are in the epic tradition for sure when we're reading Dante's Divine Comedy. What is an epic? Jot down in your notes real quickly one or two elements of an epic. What constitutes an epic? Well, you got to have an epic journey. And this poem will constitute an epic journey. Dante, and we make the distinction between Dante the writer and Dante the pilgrim. We use that term pilgrim, we could say Dante the journeyer, or the guy who takes the journey, okay? Dante writes a poem where he is going to take a long journey. This journey will include three parts of afterlife. Now, wait a minute. If it's afterlife, don't you have to be dead to go? That's an important question. Dante gets to visit the afterlife without being dead. But wait a minute, that's not unusual. Jot down real quickly at 3A one or two other epics where you're familiar with a living human being getting to visit the afterlife. And more particularly, Hades. Who are the most famous? Who's the, who's the, first, who's the most famous first of all? Who gets to go? Yeah, we think of Odysseus, don't we? Going into the underworld to visit who? Who's he got to visit when he's down there? Do you remember? Tiresias. The, uh, Tiresias, the blind prophet, right? Who will tell him, uh-oh, when you go back home, you're going to have lots of bad guys waiting for you, and they all want to marry your wife and steal all your stuff. That's the first guy. So in other words, going to, remember I had you talk about this. And did I have you even write a paper on this, a whole notion of journey to the underworld? The first, the, the, the first uh, journey in, in the epic tradition is Ulysses or Odysseus. By the way, make a note to yourself and put a little star there. Dante's going to put Odysseus in hell. Yep. The question is going to be, for what sin? Because when you look at all of the sins that Dante's going to qualify as landing you in hell, Odysseus is pretty much guilty of all of them. I mean, think a about it. Of think, think of it. Yeah, a lot of them, but Ulysses for sure. I mean, Odysseus, he's done pretty much everything. He's committed murder. He's messed around on his wife. We call that adultery. He's a great liar, correct? Right? I mean, you could go on and on. It'll be interesting to ask the question, where does Dante put Odysseus in the afterlife? What, what circle, what circle uh, does he get it? And for what reason? In other words, of all the sins that Dante commits, which one for Dante, or, or, for all, of all the sins that, Odys that Odysseus commits, which one for Dante is the worst and therefore you know, it's going to end up in, in hell for that. Wait a minute, we got another journey to the, under lot, to the underworld. What's that one? Aeneas gets to take a journey to the underworld, doesn't he? Right? 
That journey to the underworld happens. Why? Do you remember? What was the reason why Aeneas has to go to the underworld? Do you remember? Yeah, he's looking for information as well. Whoa, we're starting to see a common trend here. Let's put it in our notes. You go to the underworld not to sightsee. I say this because sometimes reading Inferno can come across this way. There's all these really grotesque kinds of tortures down in the underworld, and Dante's just getting his kicks and giggles by describing in detail all these horrific <laughs> images. No. Remember, the epic tradition is epistemological when we talk about the journey. Epistus overrelated to knowledge. It is a propedeutic. It is didactic. That is to say, you go to the underworld to learn something. So Dante is going there to learn something as well. Dante will choose as his guide, Virgil. <clears throat> of course, Virgil, <coughs> for Dante is the greatest poet. How come Virgil and not Homer? For Dante. Because Homer is... Why is Virgil considered a greater poet than Homer? Because he's Roman. Right. Roman, good, keep going. So a lot of Homer's characters are in. Pretty you bet. Lots and stuff. lots of Homer's characters end up in Dante, in Dante's hell. But why would Dante choose Virgil and not Homer? Since Homer is in many ways the creator of the epic tradition, why would he choose Virgil? And he clearly thinks Virgil's the greatest poet of all time. Why? Does he... so anybody know? Now here we get into a little bit of theology. Dante is what? In terms of his theological persuasion. He's Roman Catholic. So what? I, I don't understand. What's I got to do with Virgil? I got, what's I got to do with Virgil? I still don't understand. What makes Virgil such a big dog deal? See, we only looked really just briefly at the Aeneid. Dante would say about our class, shame on us. He would say you should have taken at least a couple of months and read all of the Aeneid line by line, doing it, for example, with Aeneid, what I'm going to do with you with Shakespeare's Hamlet. Why? I don't understand. Why? Well, it's not called the Catholic Church in Dante's day. It's called the what? Roman Catholic Church, right? That is to say, Dante believes that Rome and the Roman people are so important because they are going to help to produce the, the Christian church. And Virgil is the great poet who in his writings predicts the birth of a famous man born of a virgin. Christians later will identify, ah, oh, Virgil was, he must have been inspired in some way to say these things, and this makes him the most famous of all poets. I think I said to you, when I lectured to you on the Aeneid, that it set as a poem on the church pulpit next to the Bible as the second most sacred text. So when Dante's playing the game of naming Virgil, he's doing something intentional. Virgil is also the great poet. Dante wants to be considered a great poet. Homer we know nothing about. Virgil we know a lot about. Virgil intentionally sat down to write a history of the Roman people. And the way he did it was by saying, we actually won the, wall, the fight at Troy. The Greeks didn't win at Troy. That's a myth. Who really won at Troy was Aeneas because he escaped from Troy. And then he became Roman, and the Romans conquered the Greeks. And therefore, who won at Troy? That's Virgil's project. In other words, it's a very patriotic project. It is intended to celebrate the Roman people. Dante is doing something very similar, only now he's not celebrating the Roman people. Question for your notes. What is he celebrating? Jot it down. Don't say it. Write it. What is he celebrating? What is it that he's trying to celebrate? If it's not the Roman people, like Virgil wrote to celebrate the Roman people, what is Dante trying to celebrate? Any ideas? Is he really celebrating? Well, to what degree is he trying to point something out then, if you don't like the word celebrate? Like, what's his point? Why, 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 is, he, why is he writing this thing in the first place? You got any sense of it at all? Any ideas? What do you think, Mr. Kelleher? What's the point of this thing? It has a lot to do with Dante's biography. Revenge. Beautiful. 
It is about revenge. Wait a minute, revenge for what? Dante got thrown out of Florence and never got to go back. Dante is really mad about that. Okay? So he's going to sit down at the back end of his life and to deal with a terrible tragedy, he writes a poem. That poem is the Divine Comedy. Now, he gets to get interesting kinds of levels of revenge. One obvious one is the people you really don't like you can put in hell. Huh. Well, that's like, um, did, I can't remember which cantos it was, but there was, um, when they're going, they get the um, ferry again and they're going across through the river of sticks and it's all the mud and stuff and he sees this guy from Florence and right. a politician was that right. part of his exile? Great way. See you can throw anybody you don't like, you can throw them in hell. What's cool about that? What's funny about that and what's cool about that? You don't like somebody? You throw them in hell. What's what's ironic and funny and cool about that for Dante? All of those people are still, still alive and they know they're in hell now. Right? So here you go. You're a person alive. You're the one responsible or partly responsible for doing something nasty to Dante. He says, oh, don't worry. Mr. Kelleher called it revenge. Poetic justice, Dante would have called it. No worries. You want to jack on me? I'll jack on you. Only I'm going to do it a whole lot differenter. I'm going to put you in hell, which is everlasting punishment. That is to say, no getting out. Well, and I thought it was funny that even like while he's really mad at this guy and like is telling him like this guy's like in the mud and he's telling him that he should be punished more and he even has like Virgil agree with him. Yes. So that's another like, And if you have Virgil agree right, if you have Virgil agree, well clearly you deserve what you get. That is to say, let's put it in our notes now, retributive justice. Now what does that mean? Retributive justice. Do good, get good, do bad, get bad. In other words, there is some way to balance out the universe, okay? Also, let's just say it out loud. Dante's Catholic, but he's also a politician. Dante is a politician, and because he's a politician, he is going to try to think about a political way to answer for that wretched exile thing. The only problem is he's never getting to go back to Florence. Dante, are you ready for this? is stuck. Dante is stuck. Only that's not how he says it, is it? Miss Anderson, what does he say in the first opening books of, of the Inferno? He says he was where? Caught in where? He doesn't say he was stuck outside of Florence. He says he was walking through what? A dark forest. A dark forest. He's dark, walking through a dark forest. Why dark? I don't understand. Dark. Why dark? What's significant about it being dark? Well, I just said it. Dante is stuck. He's got nowhere to go. He's got no chance for liberation. He's got no chance for freedom. And in the midst of this, he is met by Virgil, who says, it's time you take a journey. A journey where? Into the underworld. Why would Dante need to go into the underworld? This is going to be a really intriguing question. Why would Dante need to go into the underworld? See, I, I've often had students that say, oh, I guess I really haven't thought about this. Why would Dante need to go into the underworld? Dante the Pilgrim. He's stuck. He's going to take a journey. This journey is going to be into the afterlife and more particularly to hell. Sorry. Why? Why would he need to go to hell where he sees all of these people having these terrible tortures done to them? He's trying to get to the... And Dante himself invents this story where he puts himself going through hell. Why? Why would he do this? What's the point of him doing this? For himself, what's the point of him doing this? Well, now wait a minute. That's the point of reading all of Divine Comedy. He doesn't just go to hell. He gets out. Then he goes to purgatory. Then he gets out. Then he gets to go to heaven. So in other words, Dante gets to see the entire spectrum in other words, yes, terrible first experience in hell, but there is the opportunity for emancipation, for freedom. Well, now, wait a minute. Early on, we start to realize, though, there's something fascinating about how Dante is constructing his hell. 
Notice that his hell is constructed with certain geographic and theological understandings. The geography of hell goes how? Where do you, if you want to, if you want to see Dante's hell, where do you got to go? Like the Greeks, you've got to go down. Do you remember the opening lines of Plato's Republic? I went down to the Piraeus. Remember in Republic 7, it's into a cave that we must go to find the chained prisoners. Do you think Dante knew a little bit about Plato? What are your thoughts? Yeah, when, you're, when your lecturers say that Dante is one of the most learned of poets, that's kind of what they mean. In other words, he has been schooled in the ancient classics. So Dante is completely familiar with the idea of going down into the darkness of hell, where he's going to meet people who are there. Why? Why are they there? Now, this is really interesting. Why are they there in hell? Mr. Batson, why are they there? For transgression. Or what kinds of transgression? What? By the way, Dante likes the word sin, too, doesn't he? Yeah. What kinds of sin? Well, it's kind of variant. It does vary, depending on what. Do you see any kinds of interesting order? of these sins, of these transgressions? Or is it kind of random? Do you see any intelligent design for Dante in the way he pictures his hell? There's people at the top, and then there's people at the bottom. By the way, where are there more people, top or bottom? Yeah, there's more people in the top. In other words, the deeper you go into hell, how do you want to say this? The deeper you go into hell, what will you say about it? The worse the sins, the worse the punishments. So how do you get to hell? What do you got to do to get to hell if you're a Dante, if you're in Dante's hell? Mr. Batson said sin, but wait a minute. Dante's Catholic and therefore believes that all humans have sinned. Ignorance about what? Christ. Ignorance about Christ. So you're saying the people who sin are not Christian. Are there any Christians in Dante's hell? Oh, yeah. There are. There are a lot of Catholics in Dante's hell. Which kind of, yeah, uh, Miss Barney points out, popes even end up down there for crying out loud. Which, for those of you who don't know Catholic theology, a major no-no. You're not supposed to put the vicar of Christ in hell. And Dante does it. It's People who sin are not the reason they go to hell, Miss Eve says. It's not that they sinned. Well, what is it then? It's that they like, know that they sinned and they still didn't go to the divine. Body. This is really important. It's hugely important. If you're in Dante's hell, you're not there because you're a bad person. You're there because you refuse to repent. What does repent mean? To admit guilt and to say you're sorry. This is foundational to understanding Dante's hell. By the way, he constructs, interestingly, his hell with a geography that places the sinners who have just died on a beach, right? They all have to go across a river where they then meet the outer region of hell. And there's the gates of hell. What are the what do the gates have a sign above? What does it say? Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Ah! <laughs> Mr. Batson just smiling that years ago a student placed this sign on room 303's door. Mm -hmm. uh, what is hope? Abandon all hope. Ye who enter here. What is hope? In other words, Dante says on the gates of hell, it says, down here you got no hope. What is hope? What does that word even mean? Like, okay, so the one thing you ain't going to find in hell is hope. What is that? Like, we probably should define what it is if we're not going to find it in hell. Like, what is it? What is hope? Like Miss Barney, what do you got for hope? Definition, hope. Like, 
What is hope? You, you, Dante says right away, the one thing I can absolutely guarantee you ain't going to find down here in hell is hope. You can forget about it. Abandon it. All hope. Gone. What is hope? Miss Katie, can you define that word? Hope. Um, I think it kind of like the faith letter. Faith in what way? Give up all your faith of getting out. There's no chance of getting out. That's right. There's no chance. In other words, hope is the expectation of something good, something changing. So Dante, whoa, wait a second. Dante describes people in hell who are stuck. What's ironic about that, given what Mr. Keller has said about the motivations to write this thing? Dante is stuck. But wait a minute. Dante himself is going to enter hell, and he's going to escape. Very interesting. How can he do this? How can Dante go into hell, even though he's not dead, and get out? What games are being played here? What references are we having to other epic texts? Remember, in both the Odyssey as well as the Aeneid, to get into hell and get out, you have to do what? What do you got to be able to do? Do you remember? For both Homer as well as for Virgil. What do you got to be able to do? Do you remember? How does Aeneas get into the hell? He's got to do something. He's got to go through a ritual. Very good. Yeah, he's got to go through a special ritual, right? Where you kind of pay off. You get your ticket to ride. If you've got a special ticket and you're with the right person, that's a key. Oh, yeah, because they were... You're with the right person. So Dante's going to take a guided tour of hell. What's interesting about his guided tour of hell is that Dante's going to meet people there and he's going to have conversations with them. Students have often pointed out how Dante's Inferno is basically one dialogue after another. To that degree, it starts to look kind of like Plato's dialogues. You have these little dialogues that happen. In the beginning parts of Inferno, make an observation. In the beginning parts of Inferno, you will find Dante being more compassionate towards the sinners. Notice this. He will begin to feel kind of bad for them, kind of sad for them. Oh, that's sad. I want to hear your story. And then he begins to identify with it. As he gets deeper into hell, he begins to less and less have that level of compassion. One of the interesting questions will be why. What is it about the events that transpire that make Dante start to think differently about these people in hell? By the way... Because the people that exiled them are down there, and so he starts showing... Like, that's true. That's true. He begins, to, uh, he begins to recognize more cleanly the people who are responsible for his exile. Keep going. Notice what's interesting about right in the circle of hell, at the center of hell. What's at the center of hell, along with the ice? Well, who's there? Satan. At the very center of hell is Satan. Satan has what coming out of his mouth? He's got three people. Oh, yeah. Who are they? Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. Now, that's important. By the way, that's a simple question for the exam. You can pretty much predict that question is going to be on the exam. Ms. Damiano, who are the three people out of Satan's mouth at the center of hell? Do you remember? One of them is Judas. Judas. What do we know about Judas? Judas does what in New Testament theology? What's he responsible for? He betrays Christ how? He gives him a what? He gives him a kiss on the cheek. Good. Who's the second one there? Cassius. Who is Cassius and why should I care? And who's the third one? Yeah, they go together, don't they? What these two cats do? We learned about these guys when we were sophomores. They betrayed Caesar. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. The worst three imaginable people for Dante are those three guys. They end up in the very center of hell. And what is it that they did that's so terrible for Dante? See, we're going to see Dante's biases starting to happen. What do you think, Miss Sin? What did those three cats do that was so terrible for Dante? Betrayal. That's a huge one. They betrayed someone. Right? Cassius and Brutus betrayed who? Betrayed Caesar. Right? And Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. So he's comparing... Betrayal is the worst thing imaginable for Dante. You can't do anything worse than betrayal. It begs a really interesting 3B question. If you were constructing hell... 
What sin for you would be the worst sin that you would put at the center of your hell? <coughs> for Dante, it is betrayal. And now we come back to the comment Andy made. Dante is betrayed big time. He sees that as the worst of sins. Why is betrayal such a big dog deal? Think platonically, uh, platonically. Why is betrayal such a big dog deal? Why would Plato say betrayal is the worst? What does betrayal do? I don't understand. Why? Why is betrayal such a big deal? What, by the way, is betrayal? What is betrayal? You say one thing... And then do something else. Right? You give up someone who is innocent. In Dante's world, that's kind of betrayal. I don't understand, Schreiber, why? Like, like, why is that a big dog deal? He sees that as the worst of imaginable sins. Worse than murder. Worse than, than stealing. Worse than raping. I've often had seniors that say, you know, in my hell... Child molesters would be at the center. Dante doesn't put them there. He puts three cats that betrayed somebody. That led, by the way, to that somebody's what? Death. Death. I understand. Does betrayal like pretty much Judas didn't kill Christ. He just told them where to find him. Because it almost seems like any time there's betrayal, it seems like one of the, like, those major sins come with it, too. Yeah. Like That's there's, true. There's, there's betrayal is almost never a sin alone. There's usually some deception or lying involved. Dante has a place for that. And then again, like, most of the time, like, I mean, like, with child molesters and rapists and people who lie and everything else, most of the time, like, you have people that you do know. Then you have people that you don't know. Ah. But with the trail, it's always somebody that you're close with and they have that trust. Eves is pointing out a really important observation. In the center of Dante's hell, the worst of sins are the sins that are both not just individual, but communal, collective. When you betray, think about it. When Brutus and Cassius betray Caesar, it's the end of the Roman Empire without realizing it. Do you remember... When you study as a sophomore that play, remember what Mark Anthony says he's going to unleash the dogs of what? Do you remember those lines from that play? Anthony is responsible for whipping up, remember, the hysteria that will follow when everybody goes nuts and starts killing everybody? He says he will unleash the dogs of hell. Looking backwards, you can say that Roman civilization ended with the death of Caesar. And everything starts to kind of go downhill. Now, you can see that a few hundred years after Roman history. Do you got me? So you can kind of look at the moment when Caesar is assassinated and say, it all went downhill from there. To that degree, for Dante, betrayal is the worst of sins because it's communal. Lots of people are affected long term. In other words, for Dante, there's two kinds of negative acts. There's those negative acts that you would do to another single individual, and then there's those acts that you would do that would have collective. Now, I don't understand. Why would Plato care about that? That is Plato's project in Republic, remember? To try to create political harmony. In other words, for Dante, the worst thing you could ever do is to not be a good citizen. Really? Really, really. He sees that far worse than being a child molester. He sees that far worse than murdering somebody. In other words, murdering somebody because you're mad at them, that's a moment of passion, right? Anger, rage. But to betray somebody, that has to take premeditation and thought, right? By the way, what do you find ironic about the fact that Dante will put Brutus in hell at the center of hell in 1300, but some 300 years later, Shakespeare will write the classic play, Julius Caesar. What is his treatment of Brutus? More noble. He does see Brutus as far more noble. Shakespeare is responding to Dante. In the ideal world, we would have studied our Dante before we studied our Shakespeare. So that when we picked up Julius Caesar, we would have been able to... Oh, wait a minute. 
Shakespeare is very influenced by Dante, though. What is it that's wrong with what Romeo and Juliet do in that play? See, when you're a freshman, you're too stupid to understand stuff like this. Now you've got a little bit of context and you can start to see it. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet is not a love story. Anyone that calls it so, of course, doesn't know the play. And Romeo and Juliet themselves are rarely on stage and almost never together. With the exception of a bedroom scene that Shakespeare never actually wrote, right? I mean, there's no real, none of that. It's not about exchange of fluids. It's not even about getting married. What is Shakespeare's point in Romeo and Juliet? Two children go against the rules. They betray their family. And in the process, they die, and the family feud has to continue its problems as well. In other words, Shakespeare will agree with Dante. The worst thing is betrayal. Lying, deceiving, leads to betrayal. Premeditated. That, of course, the fact it's premeditated makes it even worse, right? There is no remorse. There is no regret. Now, that's an interesting question. Does Shakespeare write a Brutus or draw a Brutus that shows remorse or regret? Hmm. Question. Do you agree with the way Dante sets up his hell in terms of his two things? Sins that will be punished. In other words, can you identify any sin that Dante sees as a sin that lands you in hell? That about that sin you would go, really? This cannot be a sin punishable by going to hell. Come on. Did you find any of those kinds of sins where you kind of look at it and go, that's really weird. And then secondly, did you find any of the punishments of these people down in hell that for you, you say, man, I don't know that it, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. In other words, the punishment seems way worse than the crime. Or do you rather see it the other way? The punishment definitely fits the crime. Let's take a look at some of these and, uh, you know, kind of kind of start to work ourselves through it. Um, when, we, when we meet our, um, uh, our first, you know, kind of opening uh, uh, cantos, Let's work through it real quickly. Mr. Batson, you're working with us in Canto 3-4. I'm more interested in Canto 4. What is Limbo and why should we care? Limbo is essentially where all the virtuous pagans go and this kind of... Right, Dante's got a problem theologically. Explain that problem to us. Uh, these people didn't know Christ. Right, they died before Christ's birth, and therefore they're not Christian. But they were virtuous. But they're also really great people. I mean, Dante can't put Plato in hell. Dante can't put Socrates in hell. Wait a minute, Socrates was betrayed. Remember? Miletus and the rest of them, right? Dante will see Socrates as a hero, but he's not Christian. So that means he can't go to heaven. But he can't be punished, but he can't be punished in hell. So you create this limbo. What is limbo? What's it look like? Uh, actually, kind of like if you think to uh, Aeneas' trip to the underworld. Yes. When he sees his father in kind of like that field. Yes. It's essentially kind of a recreation of that with like a giant citadel of human reason in the it's middle. It's beautiful, comfortable. Everyone sits around on the green grass reading poetry and talking about ideas. Yeah, he says it's the, um, like the closest thing you can get to God's glory without having God. Yeah, it's fascinating. Dante puts a land of bliss in hell. Calls it limbo. Doesn't he also expect to put himself there too? The Dante place? is Dante is excited when he walks up. Remember, he's the one writing this, so he can do this. And they say, "Oh, you're that great poet." Yes, I am. <laughs> See how he can do that? Yes, I am. Right? Okay. So this is Dante kind of tipping his hat to himself. He somehow already knew that what he was writing was going to be a famous text, right? That people were going to see it as a famous text. Limbo is Dante's answer to, what do you do with all the people who aren't Christian and therefore can't go to heaven, but they're nice people. They're good enough people. They're virtuous. One or two academic skeptics have said, I may not care about going to heaven, but I certainly wouldn't mind going to Limbo. And you can now kind of understand the joke that's involved there. That is to say, you get to spend eternity having conversations with Plato and Aristotle, Socrates. 